Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Super Comic Fun Times Live Daily Vlog. Um, today, being New Comic Book Day Eve, we are going to go over the books that I've read uh, that I haven't got to because, you know, it was three-day weekend, lots of stuff going on. It's summertime. Yay! It's the first day after Memorial Day, which in the United States at least, uh, and at least on our calendar, that's what we consider summer. Summer goes from Memorial Day to Labor Day, even though that's not quite astronomically correct. That's just um, how we emotionally experience summer in the, in the United States. So we had a three-day weekend, honored our um, war dead, and, um, you know, sent us... Uh, uh, the, the uh, sacrifices to to the gods on our cookouts and, and that sort of thing. So, um, so and I also had some time to read. So let's see, I've got quite a stack to get through today. So I'll just uh, show you here. So I suppose it's not that big compared to other things, but it's like one, two, three, four, five books to talk about. One I talked about briefly on... Um, Twitter, I did a live stream yesterday. Uh, it was just kind of like uh, super comic fun time recommends. And uh, it was like probably less than two minutes. So I'm going to talk about the book more in depth today. But we are going to start off with a book that's a little older. This is from around 2014, I think. This is really a cool cover. I love the cover. Um, so this is uh, the uh, Infinity Man and the Forever People. So who we see here on the cover is Mark Moonrider and um, Beautiful Dreamer. And pretty much the cover tells the story. Is um, Mark Moonrider is dead and uh, so spoilers for this like um, four year old book. The cool thing about it is even the ad on the back, like uh, even though it's not lenticular like that it is and well i guess it is kind of lenticular but it's more of a 3d effect like they use it here but i just thought that was cool and i guess they would have to so i guess um what was this american dad it went to tbs in 2014. um i haven't seen that show in for ages so um you know let's go through the good the bad and the ugly the artwork was pretty good on this especially this opening shot it just starts dream or no and so like this was part, this was like a new 52 uh, one shot, Not, uh, excuse me, a future's end one shot. Um, yeah, it says so right there. And uh, this story is by Dan Didio and Keith Griffin. Uh, Philip Tan did the pencils and Jason Paz did the inks. So this, uh, yeah, I like the artwork in this book, um, but, and I don't know how this story fits into Future's End. As I've mentioned before, I have um, the complete, the, I think it's a three volume set on Comixology. I picked that up a couple of months ago when it was on sale and I was all set to read that when I started getting new comics. Um, I, I never had gotten new comics before, except, you know, occasionally. Like a couple of years ago, I started getting Letter 44, but only on Comixology. And then I kind of stopped and I went back to my omnibuses and collected editions and whatnot. But, um, but yeah, so, and of course, this isn't a new book, but uh, the comic book shop I, I go to has, uh, I, I love this, there's this ad here. So I don't know if you can see it. So there's a guy there with a bone through his nose and a dog looking longingly at it. And it's like bad combo and then good combo. So like combos are this kind of snack with a, so, you know, it's kind of like a pretzel with a filling in the middle, like peanut butter or cheese or something like that. So, uh, so yeah, overall, this story is, um, you know, you kind of read it for the art because all it is is beautiful dreamer can't um, deal with the loss of her lover, Mark Moonrider. And so like he keeps trying to talk to her and he keeps trying to leave. And he's like saying, my whole life is defying <coughs> everything. You're not gonna be able to keep me here. And um, in the end, like he, you know, there's this, it's kind of like, um, what's that movie where you're in a dream? Um, Inception, 
uh, it's kind of like Inception, but only like one layer in that um, he recognizes that she is trying to keep him away from this hatch. And then he gets her to, or he either opens it up or gets her to open it up. And then inside is her. So, and then she explains that he can't leave because he's dead and that this is just a dream. And, you know, she used her dream power to create, uh, to create a version of him because she couldn't deal with his loss. She, you know, she says like some cryptic things. And since I don't know what led to this, um, some of the things are like, um, uh, you know, you failed us, but I failed you and stuff like this. So I don't know if this ends up tying into uh, or how it ties into Future's End. And maybe in the coming days, I will start reading that. Um, um, yeah, so, so yeah, here we go. So like, yeah, so then he's like, says, okay, here's a boom tube. Uh, I'm going to go through it. And he starts to step through it. And then he goes, uh, something's not right. Oh, my God, I, I am not real. And then he kind of fades away. So he was like, you know, that Thanos thing. And then she's all kind of dejected. And she goes over to herself on the slab. And she says, wake up. We have to try again. Try what? I don't know. But then it ends sort of like it starts with dreamer, no. Which, you know, I guess looking in the camera, I didn't quite, you know, I guess I was just at the end of the book. I didn't notice that jaw is something else there that looks really bizarre. Here it looks, you know, here it's more, uh, I think the shading is a little better when it starts. So it doesn't look, uh, but yeah, I guess like the teeth, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if the artist is trying to tell us anything with that. Um, and like he's saying dreamer no so like maybe on some level well i guess i don't know how her power works really she can create a dream construct and uh he i think when he says dreamer no like then he kind of loses his memory but as he comes into being he's like uh so i'm talking myself into a higher score so i've got a new scoring system everything is based on venom number one venom number one being the current pinnacle uh, since I'm reading new comic books now, if I'd been reading comic books in 2015, it might be The Vision. I've read the collected edition of The Vision, but uh, right now, I, everything I read, I end up comparing to uh, to Venom number one, and I would rate this at a five based on the Venom scale. You know, Venom being the top of the heap, and that's probably a ten. I haven't quite decided that far yet. So uh, I love the cover. I'm glad I got this. I think. You know, I've got the I've got one other uh, of these tie-ins that's uh, a Superman book with a lenticular cover. But I, by far, I like this cover best, and I do like this ad. This ad is even pretty nice. So you know, even though the story is it's okay, but not knowing how it ties in, um, it's hard for me to uh, to score it on anything. But you know, on its own, it's a five compared to Venom number one. Next up on the list is this book, which I think this was a reprint that came out uh, in anticipation of Justice League. They call it Justice League Essentials. And so, excuse me, this is uh, The Flash Rebirth. Uh, yeah, the nice thing about it is like uh, with the Marvel True Believer series, this is like a, a number one. So, uh, so yeah, this story is The Flash and um, it's all about how he never has enough time to do anything. He, he always feels like he's got, uh, he can accomplish, he's got 10 things on his list and he can accomplish nine of them. But if he can't accomplish all 10, what's the point? And uh, this story was pretty good. I, you know, it, it's a very wordy story. And I don't, I don't have anything against words when the words kind of propel the story, but it's kind of all an internal monologue for, for a good part of the story. Um, the artwork wasn't my favorite on this. Uh, I forgot if I said this is Dan Didio and, um, oh, no, no, no. This was Dan Didio. I'm sorry. Uh, this is Joshua Williamson is the writer. Carmine, uh, DJ Domenico is the artist. Uh, and then you have Ivan Placencia as the colorist and Steve Wands as the editor. And the cover was by Carl Kershey. So, um, 
so yeah um we get like the creation of the flash again and i kind of like this this is uh in some ways this is my favorite part of the book is like you know he's in the lab lightning strikes him and then like you kind of get the red glow in his eyes and then you're in the present day and it does get quite a bit wordy you have all of these word bubbles to read he's running all over the city from crisis to crisis and i guess there was a tornado and he ends it and he wants to go and rebuild the houses for the people but uh the fire dude says you know sorry you can't do that flash you've got to um uh, you know, we got to have a surveyor in here and stuff like that. So he realizes he's late for a crime scene. And uh, and it turns out there's a guard at Star Labs. And I guess in this point in the series, he's not married to Iris at this point. Uh, there's like this uh, other medical person here, this other uh, forensic scientist. And it seems like she's got her eye on him, but he's, you know, there, there's the thing with Iris. And of course, Iris seems to know who he is at this point, but it is confusing to me that they're not married at this point. Um, and so like, you know, uh, he talks to this cop and the cop is saying like, you know, Barry, if it wasn't for you, my brother's murder would have gone unsolved or something like that. And so I don't know where that comes from. Uh, I haven't read that part of the story. And then he realizes he's supposed to meet um, Kid Flash, who is the new 52 Wally West with Iris. Uh, and, you know, uh, he's Iris's nephew. So they're at a mall and then they have like, you know, a little bit of character building stuff and like, this is where we find out that he feels like, you know, he's HR puffing stuff. He can't do a little because he can't do enough. And, you know, she's saying like, well, my mom always said, uh, you know, if you don't take time for yourself, it's always going to feel like, you know, you're not going to get anything done. And then just then uh, chaos, you know, like he's starting to bond with Wally. Uh, Wally's bonded with, um, with Iris because Iris is friends with the Flash. And I think... He's already the Kid Flash here because they just make a reference to it. I'm not 100% sure, but he had some science homework and Barry is offering to help him with it because he goes, no problem. I got it done fast. So I think he's already the Kid Flash at this point, but I don't, I don't really know. Um, and uh, so like he's got two emergencies to go to. One is like, oh, that cop he was talking to whose brother, you know, he helped solve the murder. Uh, the, the Star Labs, uh, he, he, he got pulled for a Star Labs guard duty and uh, that uh, transport is under attack and then there's a fire at the same time. So Barry decides to go to the fire first because he thinks he can rescue everybody from the fire. And while that's going on, the van is being robbed and it turns out that the guys who robbed it were the same guys who killed this cop's brother and they're going to uh, kill him too. And then like uh, we get this whole line about when Barry was first hit with the bolt of lightning, he saw his you know time stopped and he saw his flash, his life flash before his eyes. And he saw like his death would mean that his mother's murder never gets solved and his dad would um, languish in prison. And he saw his life as unfulfilled. And then I guess he got the power. I, I don't know how that worked, but the speed force was apparently created when Barry gets struck by lightning. So then something else happens here where, um, I mean, at first I thought Barry was throwing his own lightning power at the guy and he was going to like kind of throw him down. But then he says that it wasn't him. And then this guy starts to get powers maybe. And then it's to be continued. So and I, I then beyond this, you know, they have like a little bit of a uh, explanation of the Flash, and they have uh, back catalogs of uh, Flash stories and whatnot. Uh, got some nice art. I like this art for the Justice League. I like Batman, Superman. That's kind of cool. This book makes me sad that Justice League wasn't better. I mean, it wasn't terrible. I went to see it, uh, but it just wasn't. You know, it needed to knock it out of the park. I get they they'd had success with Wonder Woman where that more or less knocked it out of the park. 
but they really needed to do it with uh, Justice League. I have to say my favorite part of Justice League was the beginning part with Wonder Woman where she starts this kind of cult who is robbing a bank or something. I kind of forget what was going on there, but I thought that was going to lead into like their worshipers of dark side or something like that. You know, he's got the crime syndicate. He would be controlling them, but no, they just, they have this one scene with wonder woman stopping this bank robbery. And then it had nothing to do with the rest of the movie. That was probably my favorite part of that movie. I, I thought if they would have built from there, they could have maybe had something. Ah, I don't know. So next up is True Believers number one, Groot. Now, oh yeah, I was going to rate this one. So I would say on the uh, Venom scale, it's about a six. I enjoyed some of the insights I got. I guess like I've got another scale in my mind when it comes to The Flash because of reading the first two uh, Jeff Johns books, which was the Wally West Flash, the original Wally West Flash. And then I read a book last October from, you know, from the pile, which was kind of like a Halloween book, even though it wasn't, you know, the cover was deceptive. It looked like there were these zombies coming, but I really enjoyed that book too. And I think that, that Wally West character in the Jeff Johns run in that book from, I think it was like around 87. Um, those were like much better stories you, uh, th than this. So, uh, you know, I guess it's hard to rate those since they're in the past. You have to have some kind of inflation to get up to the level, uh, Venom number one. But I would say like, you know, adjusted for infl inflation, those books are like sevens, eights, nines. Uh, uh, you know, maybe even like reaching up to the, the Venom level itself because some of them were just really, really good in the uh, Jeff John series. And I thought that one that I read from the pile was really good too. It made me want to read more from like, I can't remember if it was like from 90 or 87 or, you know, whenever that was, that was kind of a cool story. It just had all this stuff going on. And I think that's the problem here is like, there isn't a lot going on. And that's the problem with the forever people here. You've got two people. Like, I guess if I had come into this and knowing how uh, Mark had died, uh, you know, it just, but this seems like almost like a Twilight Zone story. And I don't know why it's part of Future's End because I haven't read Future's End yet. So, so you know, that's why that one is uh, so low on the Venom scale. Uh, this one, I guess, you know, now that I mentioned those Jeff Johns books, um, I, I've talked myself lower. So this is going to be, I think, uh, about a five, two, a five on the Venom scale. Okay, so then we've got Groot, and this one needs a lot for a lot of adjustment for inflation to the Venom scale because these are kind of like, you know, they're almost like adapted radio plays. Uh, I guess they could be adapted Twilight Zones too. So this is Groot, the first appearance of Groot, and he's a much different Groot than we get in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. He is the ruler of Planet X, and he comes to Earth. He has control over all wood. It's like, um, you know, this um, man and wife are driving home after a party and she's like saying something like, oh, that Bill is such a hunk. Why can't you be more like Bill, Leslie? And like his name is Leslie. So he's even got kind of like, you know, I don't know how it was when this book was written. Like, I think it was written in the 50s or something. I don't know if Leslie was considered kind of, uh, you know, less than manly name. Then I don't think it was because you had people like Leslie Nielsen, and he is kind of, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of macho. So um, I'm not sure if that plays into it. I think it's probably just a name. Um, so anyways, they're driving, and then, you know, he's kind of ignoring her, and they see a kind of UFO crash. And he wants to go investigate it, and she goes, Oh, I'm so tired, dear. Let's just go home. And in the next couple of days, he gets engrossed in his work, which he's a botanist, I think it says here. Um, and he was too busy examining the object, but then Ellis came into the lab. Yeah, I forget. I think he's a botanist, but he's a. Uh, it makes sense that he's a botanist because yeah, you have the cover, like you know, well, you have it right here. He goes. Behold, I am Groot, uh, the invincible, who dares to defy me. And then this guy, who doesn't look like anything like the guy in the uh, in the book, says, "I'll defy you, Groot, and I'll do it before midnight." So, so, <laughs> so, um, 
so yeah, so like he's working in the lab, you know, they see this UFO and then he forgets about it for a couple of days because he's so busy with his work. And then she says, oh, uh, two of our trees disappeared and like the neighbor's picnic table, all this stuff made out of wood is disappearing. He goes, huh, well, I'm sure like, it's just a prank. Yeah, somebody's going to steal your tree because it's a prank. <laughs> and they'll turn them off. <laughs> what? <laughs> so that was kind of funny. But then um, he gets an idea that maybe it has something to do with what's happening in the forest. And he comes upon Groot, who is uh, collecting all this wood. And it's, you know, some of it he's absorbing into himself and uh, growing stronger. And I love this, like, picture of shock of this guy. It's like, you know, he spies on him here. And then, like, I just love this. He goes, I had to get back to town to tell the sheriff. Then he goes there and the sheriff is like, oh, you know, I don't believe you. And then this other guy with a cowboy hat comes in and he goes, Sheriff, I just saw an eight foot monster out there. We got to do something. And then they all go. Then, you know, you've got the, this reminds me a little of War of the Worlds, uh, the 1953 uh, production, uh, you know, based on the H.G. Wells story. Probably my favorite for a long time. That was my favorite sci-fi movie of all time. Uh, it's a good movie if you've never seen it. Um, and so, like, you know, they're trying to stop him, and, you know, the bullets don't do much. So, uh, so yeah, you know, I mean, just taking this Kirby art, it's really nice, really nice on this paper stock. So that's really a feast. So, like, Groot is, like, saying that you know, he's come to collect the town, and they're going to take it back to his planet, Planet X, and do experiments there. And he explains to them why, uh, you know, resistance is futile. He can control the trees, and the trees will form around the town and the roots will form a net and then he'll like guide this tree spaceship into space and <laughs> take it to planet X. <laughs> Sounds silly when you talk about it. <laughs> and so like, you know, um, then, uh, then you have the, the scene from the cover. He goes, hear me Groot, you may withstand our weapons, but by the heavens above, I alone promise to destroy you before you can take our town. So it's not like before midnight, it's before you can take the town. So then, like, he runs away. And, like, you know, Groot comes to attack him, and then uh, he runs away. And everybody's, like, saying, oh, I'm not surprised. I, would, I don't blame him, you know. I'll take the cowardly route. And then he, like, goes home, and he works. I think it's another two days while, you know, the uh, sheriffs of people are trying to fight Groot, and nothing is working. They try to set him on fire, but his wood is too dense to burn. And then... Um, you know, the wife comes and harangues uh, her husband. You know, she's right here. Uh, yeah, she's right here. And she says, um, what are you hiding in here for? Why aren't you out there with the other men trying to stop that monster? Must you be weak and spineless to the end? And so he's like, you know, not only her insults bothered me, but I was too busy. <laughs> I was too busy now to pay any attention to her. And so he, like, goes out there and he puts down, like, you know, these little briefcases or something. And then Groot dies. And, you know, I referenced uh, the 1953 War of the Worlds. And do you know what kills Groot? It's not the common cold virus, but it's termites. <laughs> <laughs> I guess fast acting termites. And he says, like, you know, um, you destroyed him just like you promised you would. But how did you do it? What did you use? The deadliest enemy of wood, termites. I bred them in my laboratory. Then I brought them out here and turned them loose on Groot. Well, I'll be. I never thought of that. That's why he's a scientist and you're only a sheriff. And then this guy is, like, winking at him. And then she's like, oh, darling, <laughs> forgive me for being such a fool. I'll never, like, emasculate you again. <laughs> so, um, Fantasy Factory tonight. And then this had a second story, which was really good, too. This was um, the Hulk. So, like, you know, I don't think, you know, I've heard about um, Kirby kind of inventing Spider-Man maybe a decade before Spider-Man uh, was a thing. Like he, I think he created this character called the fly or something. And then the flies villain was kind of a Spider-Man type character, but I don't remember the whole story on that one. The point is I'd heard about that at least, but I never heard of um, a pre-Hulk Hulk. So here Kirby has apparently created 
a Hulk-like creature. And this was kind of a fun story. It's another invasion story. And, uh, you know, very soap opera-ish. Um, it starts off with, it starts off a lot like Plan 9 from Outer Space. So, like, you know, there's this UFO and these uh, planes, sh uh, these jets shoot it down because it might be commies. Um, and then they go looking for it and they don't, you know. Um, I don't think, I don't think jets are really good recon type of uh, of uh, aircraft. I, I mean, maybe they are. I don't, I've never been on a jet. I, I, I wouldn't want to be on a jet that goes so fast. It kind of like just thinking about it turns my stomach. Then we get our, our main character and he's like an electronics repair guy. Look, he's still got an old phone. So, uh, uh, people, you know, he said, people call me day or night. He goes, he's got, we got another wife problem. It's like, you know, so like this guy named Fred called up who had something and he goes, um, honey, I got to go over to Fred's place. He's having trouble with you. And she goes, don't you bother lying to me, Joe Harper. This is probably something you and Fred cooked up so you can get out of the house and go bowling. And then he goes, he tries to defend himself. He goes, I, and then he goes, oh, what's the use? He goes, that woman never believes me. In the time it would take me to convince her I'm telling the truth, I'll have Fred's machine fixed and be back home. So he, he like takes off and then he like, sees from the side of the road, I guess, he's, he sees the monster somehow. And then he goes and uh, he tries to rescue it. And his like, thoughts are altruistic. He thinks, oh, I'll save this creature and it will tell us, you know, it'll give us the secrets of the universe. And so like he's, he works all night on it. And then finally he finds like the right way to plug into it or something. Cause I guess it's a partly metal monster. And then we find out that he had been on a planet with all kinds of other creatures. And, you know, while he's charging, he goes, he goes, just charge me up. And then he goes, okay, well, while we're waiting, why don't you tell me about yourself? And uh, the monster says, then the supply ship came. And when the guards weren't looking, I stole their ship and uh, headed to Earth. But then I ran out of fuel and I crashed here. And then the guy goes, hey, wait a minute. Why were you on this planet? And what do you mean by guards? And it turns out it's a prison planet where they put people who, so they can't be a menace. And then like, you know, and apparently that was a good reason to, and the guy tries to shut off the power, but it's too late because the Hulk has uh, got too much power by now. And then he just decides to hypnotize the guy. He goes, I'm going to try something on you that doesn't work on stronger creatures. And so he hypnotizes him and uh, he goes, Tell me, Earthling, who am I? What do you think of me? And uh, the guy goes, you are mankind's benefactor. You are all good, all wise. We must obey you in everything. He goes, ha, it works. And then he like unhypnotizes the guy because that was just kind of a test sample. And uh, the dude, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Hulk just tells him his plan that he's going to have people of earth like if you ever saw night slaves it's an old tv movie and there was like this really good um hulk novel in the early 80s i think that it stole the plot of night slaves and put the hulk in it and he had to fight this monster named shambhala now night slaves the um the plot of that is like this uh guy who's got a metal plate in his head and his wife go on vacation they stop in this town and then it turns out that at night everybody is like hypnotized and they go and they dig all night because some spaceship crashed there with an alien who's controlling them. And the guy has a plate in his head and that prevents him from being controlled. But then, yeah, so that's why it's called Night Slaves. And then the Hulk story stole that, that basic plot. But since I'd read the book first, that I, I really liked it, especially like when the Hulk fought Shambhala because it was kind of like a octopus type creature. And, uh, but it could, uh, put a current through its body. And so the Hulk would try to grab at it. And it was like one of these books that just it put the visual information right in my brain. And it talked about when the Hulk tried to fight Shamala, he like grabbed it and it electrocuted him. And it talked about how it was like trying to grab um, jello laced with glass. And so I, I don't know, I thought that was a, I always thought that was a good story. I don't know if they ever adapted it into a comic book or if it was based on a comic book, but it was kind of fun. So anyways, I digressed. So like, the whole plot of this is like the monster wants to get to the other side of the universe. I don't know why. He never really says. I guess it's his home. Uh, 
but he doesn't say what he's going to do there. He just talks about how he's going to have the people build this uh, spaceship. And like, uh, it's going to be so powerful when it blasts off, it destroys the earth. And since, um, what's his name, the electrician rescued him, he decides he's going to spare that guy. And so he starts hypnotizing him. And, um, and did he do it already back here? Yeah, I mean, you know, this monster talks a lot. And, uh, you know, he doesn't really care about uh, conquest of the earth. But um, when he hypnotizes, he hypnotizes everybody everywhere on earth. And then they all start building a spaceship for him. And then, like, uh, on the last day before it's going to take off and the earth's going to be destroyed, suddenly the electrician gets an idea. <laughs> and then so he sneaks off. And... Um, you know, these guards are here. He goes, we've seen him with our master. He is our master's friend. We'll let him in. And then he goes and does something at the council while, you know, the space monster is looking at the maps of outer space in order to find his way back to the other end of the universe where I guess he comes from. And so, like, when the monster climbs into the ship, he gets uh, frozen into an electronic spell. And then our, our, uh, our hero... Uh, reduces the blast to a fraction of the cost uh, uh, power that it was that you know would have destroyed the earth which you know it doesn't make sense anyways like you know if you pushed on the earth hard enough i don't think it's going to get how is that going to get you to the end of the universe faster anyways um it was still a fun story so like what it ends up happening is you know he reduces the uh blast off so that it won't destroy the earth and puts it in orbit around the sun where the monster will remain eternally frozen at the end and then we get some uh some nice uh covers it tells you what these are for like the one with group was from guardians of the galaxy number one it was a variant cover so these are all variant covers that use jack kirby stuff And those are kind of cool. So yeah, this one, I would say this is about a seven, you know, uh, with some inflation. You have to accept that this is stories from the 50s and they were fun stories. You have to accept all the plot holes and they were fun plot holes. I mean, you know, they're all just melodramas. That, that's kind of good. So next up, we have a hunt for Wolverine number one. Now I looked at the other hunt for Wolverine book, which, um, you know, it started off in this town, and this one was, um, it was okay. This whole Hunter Wolverine thing isn't really grabbing me. So it, what it turns out is, like, when Wolverine died, he was sealed in this antinanium, uh, antinamnium, uh, you know, uh, antin, whatever it's called, the metal that is virtually indestructible. And so these guys are reavers, and they want to get uh, what's his name's DNA and sell it because he's dead. But they figure they need some money in order to repair themselves because reavers are apparently um, what are they? They're robots or something. So yeah, you know, you get some stuff. Then you get like the whole backstory of uh, how Wolverine there uh, ended up in there. You have Reed Richards coming to the funeral, like only like the core X-Men know where Wolverine is supposedly buried. And everybody's surprised Reed Richards is there. They didn't know they were that close, but it turns out when Wolverine was dying, he came to Richards to try to get cured. Uh, here you have like in the flashback, um, what's her name is still as the Mohawk, but in the present day, she has long flowing hair. Not sure what's up with that. I guess I'll find out at some point. Um, so yeah, I don't know how much to say about this story. Um, you know, the Reavers find out that uh, his body isn't in there, and um, and yeah, then we find out where his body really is, and the X Men go there, and his body isn't there, and so the hunt for Wolverine is on. Then there's a backup story where uh what's her name kitty pride comes to see tony stark and this is kind of like setting up the other books in this series like um yeah it turns out like 
Tony Stark says, well, I'm glad you came to me first. And she goes, well, actually, I went to Daredevil first. And he goes, Daredevil? You know, that guy, don't he, he ain't no master scientist. But, it, you know, it was just setting up, like, these other books. So you got the Daredevil book. Um, then you have the one I read, The uh, Claws of the Killer, which, you know, I'm not sure about, you know, this story was maybe slightly better. But I'm going to say in the Venom scale, this one is maybe a six, and the previous one is that I read, The Claws of the Killer, is maybe 5.5. .5. I'm very conflicted on this. I don't know if I want to read any more of these. Um, I, I, I might see if I can get the Daredevil story, but it's like... Nothing happens. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of exposition and explaining things, but uh, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I care enough to to continue with that. Which brings us to the pick of the week, Teether. This one is from um, Atlantic, and uh, not Atlantic, Antarctic Press, and it is by uh, David Hutchinson. He did the story and the art. Very good art. Uh, I was a little worried about this book because I don't really like gross out stuff that much, but the gross out stuff didn't really bother me. Um, you know, you see this, you've got, you know, it's, it's got like kind of a stranger things vibe going on here. These kids go out to the woods to hunt this demon that supposedly lives here. Um, the name of the place is Carroll Hill, Indiana, where they live. Population 569. So, you know, you have um, these kids out in the woods, and then this monster actually shows up, and they're all like, oh, my God, it's real. And then uh, this girl gets her head bitten off, and, uh, and then she turns up later. So that kind of reminded me of Stuart Gordon. Um, and then you have this other kid. Who's, there's two new kids. There's the girl, and then there's this guy who didn't go with the kids because he'd been sick for a week. So, you know, I have my theories about it. It's like um, at the end, the girl shows up back, and then she kills one of the kids who took her to the woods. But then, it's yeah, it's it's interesting. I really enjoyed this story, um, and you know, it's. Uh, you should probably check this one out. This is this is going to be the third title I add to my poll list. I'm going to do that when I go to the store. I think I'm going to go to the store tomorrow. Um, if not tomorrow, then Thursday. And um, and yeah, I mean, you have a nice amount of stuff going on. You meet the kids, and it might it might help that I've read that I've watched Stranger Things. So like you know it. It kind of inoculates me to certain things, but I don't really know what's going on here. It, maybe everything is a hallucination. Maybe, like, you know, we know one of the kids is a monster, but is the other kid a monster too? I don't know. I'm probably spoiling it. I probably shouldn't spoil it, but uh, you should definitely buy it. Uh, check it out. It's a good book. Um, and then, like, you know, after the story, you do have a lot of the con you know, the concept art, so, you know, sketches and stuff. And then I'm not sure when Teether 2 comes out, but I definitely want to get it. So, yeah, on the Venom scale, this one is pretty high. This one is, I would say, 7.4. 7.4. It's not quite Venom, but it's up there. And, you know, I have to say this, I think this is just a regular size comic. One reason that this one, this one is a double-sized issue and you know venom is a double-sized issue too or like you know it's an extra issue i mean it's the both this one and venom are are thicker this one has a backup story so it doesn't use the whole thing to tell its main story it it tells its main story which nothing really happens and uh i mean it's all set up uh, this stuff happens. It was fun, and it's it's still set up, it's still setting things up for future issues. But it makes you want to read. So you know that's why I you know this one is is much higher on the list. And then you got Venom itself, which I read Venom again this week. 
because I, you know I, I keep thinking about this book. Is it as good as I say? Yes. This whole book it doesn't have a backup feature. It's the whole story. They use everything. It's perfect. So like yeah, right now, current uh, current year Marvel. This is uh, this is perfection. Current current book comic books. Um, this you know at least for what I've read. I I don't read everything. I can't read everything. I haven't read um, Doomsday Clock. I hear that's very good too. I'm tempted to pick up all of the back issues if I can get that one. Um, so uh yeah it's new comic book day eve what are you getting i think um man of steel one comes out tomorrow is that right i i looked it up earlier not a whole lot of stuff looked uh that looked interesting to me came out so i uh i don't know if i can get man of steel one i think that's going to be my one new book i get and then you know uh i think i'm going to get weapon lost i think i'm going to get the daredevil story just in case that's good maybe one of these will be good i mean they're not bad but they're not for setting up a big event they're disappointing whereas venom i don't know i don't even to me this book came out of nowhere i had no interest in venom just somebody was really excited about it on twitter so i said i'm gonna give that a guy i try and uh and i really liked it and i still really like it and so yeah so you know you've got mythology you know you've got what's his name uh um is it grunwald the 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 beast that uh beowulf has to fight um grendel i'm sorry grendel and then uh then you know just the psychology between um eddie brock and uh and the symbiont and you get some backstory of the symbiont <laughs> so yeah this this book this book is great so pinnacle pinnacle so uh so yeah i've already forgotten what i've rated everything so tell me how you would rate them tell me what your scale is what are you planning on getting tomorrow and um i will be back as soon as i know i'll probably if i get books tomorrow i will do a a, a show then if i don't get books tomorrow i might read some more you know it's summer i do a lot of stuff outside i i read a couple of books uh, a couple of the books i read Tonight, just, uh, you know, I went outside to water the plants, and while the plants were watering, I read a couple of books. So, yeah, it's that magical time of year, summer. So, anyways, uh, if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. Uh, comment down below. Tell me what you're getting tomorrow, if you're getting anything. Tell me what you're excited for this summer. If you like uh, The Hunt for Wolverine and the associated books, tell me about that, too. If you love Venom as much as I do, tell me about that too. So um, that's going to be it for now. Super comic fun time out.